you. Hello, everyone. I'm going to uh, share my screen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break the talk in half. I'm going to talk about what it means to be a Christian, and then I'm going to talk about the Crusades, and then give you guys a chance to respond, ask any questions or whatever. Then I will resume and go into uh, uh, um, slavery and the oppression of women. And uh, then, I'll, then, of course, I'll stop and you can ask whatever you want. And so with that in mind, uh, is there any Jane thing that we need to say or anything before I get rolling here? No, you could maybe share a little bit about yourself. Ah, uh, yes. My name's Clay Jones. I'm a visiting scholar at Talbot School of Theology. And uh, I'm actually, you know, the class that I taught, by the way, for those of some of you who've taken the class, the class that I taught uh, is now, it's going to be offered a distance version. Sean McDowell is going to be teaching. It's 14 weeks long, but I'm lecturing for five of the 14 weeks. Uh, and so for five of the 14 weeks, uh, the students will be hearing me talk on the problem of evil. And I'm honored to have the opportunity for that. And they, they intend to have me out to lecture during the summer sessions and stuff like that. I'm looking forward to coming out and doing that during the summer. So, uh, but I've authored a couple of books. One of them is Why Does God Allow Evil? That's on behind my right shoulder. And the other one is Immortal, How the Fear of Death Drives Us and What We Can Do About It. So should I say anything else, Jane, or is that enough? Um, that's good. Okay. <clears throat> people, sometimes people give me these long introductions and I'm like, uh, whatever. I, anyway, I don't need it. I'm good. Uh, well, I'm going to share my screen now and we're going to talk about uh, crusades, slavery, and the oppression of women. It's a pretty direct talk, uh, but you're all adults, and I think you can handle it, and we'll, here we go. Uh, no, that wasn't right. Where is share, there's share screen, and uh, nope, this one, this one, and share. There we go. So everybody sees that okay, I take it, and, and, and we're kind of kind of off and moving your photos off to the side. There we go. Crusade, slavery, and the oppression of women. <clears throat> but before we get into these things, I, I need to talk about what it means to be a Christian, because I think a lot of people don't get this truth. Uh, some of you may have seen my recent blog entitled, Most Christians Aren't. And then I mentioned crusades, saving, rescuing Jews, and, and things like that. But um, most Christians are, what is a Christian? A Christian, when it, because what happens in these things, these are what, if you go to my blog and you go down to the bottom and you select, you know, it has a category thing, select Christian hypocrisy. And that's what this is. The things we're talking about here, are what I consider to be under the Christian hypocrisy thing. Also, this relates to the problem of evil. That's why I decided to study these things because the question is, if Christians have the good news, and if they really are changed from within and really are sons of God, how come it seems like they do so much bad stuff? And I think that's a legitimate question. I think it does. Uh, it's related to the problem of evil. Uh, why do Christians do so much evil if they are uh, God's people? What, what's going on in that? Uh, but a Christian, one of the things that I say when people say, well, Christians did this or that or the other thing, uh, one of the things I'll say is, you know, a Christian is by definition someone who follows the teachings of Christ. I actually had a guy on the radio when I did my radio show. He goes, uh-uh. And I'm thinking, wow, what on earth? He doesn't think that a Christian is someone who follows the teachings of Christ. Usually, though, when somebody would say that kind of thing to me, I go, yeah, huh? But anyway, Christians are more than forgiven sinners. Not everybody who calls themselves a Christian is a Christian. And here's a, a phrase that I think will maybe blow some of your minds, few people have been Christians in the history of the world. Uh, it, you've never had a majority, in my opinion, in, at any point in the history of the world. And I'm going to mention this scripture, well, I won't mention now now because I'm going to lay it, mention it later. Rodney Stark is a professor at Baylor University, and he said that in the Middle Ages, what happened is by overlaying pagan festivals and sacred places with Christian interpretations, the church made it easy to become a Christian so easy that actual conversion seldom occurred. And I'm afraid a lot of that is what has happened here in the United States, frankly. I was raised in Campus Crusade for Christ. I have a lot of respect for them. Now they go by crew. But the four spiritual laws, I think, was is, is not that good, honestly. 
a lot of you may not even know what the four spiritual laws are, but it made it too easy to be a Christian. It was like, well, do you think you're a sinner? Yeah, we'll pray this prayer right now and you can be saved. Well, I'm afraid there's a little bit more to it than that. In fact, I've got a blog entitled, The Sinner's Prayer Never Saved Anyone. And when I did that on the radio program, when I had my radio program and we had a call and talk program and I said, and we always had a contention for the day. And one day we said, our contention today is that no one's ever been saved by praying the sinner's prayer in the history of Christianity. If you disagree with us, give us a call. Lines, all the lines lit up. The first call is like, what? No one's ever been saved by praying the sinner's prayer. I said, not in the history of Christianity. It's never happened even one time. He's like, what are you talking about? And I said, for by grace, you've been saved through. And he goes, faith? Yeah, faith. You're saved by faith. You're not saved by the prayer. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not opposed to praying the prayer. The prayer is fine. But the prayer doesn't save you. Faith. You're saved by grace through faith. And I'm afraid, and I've taught this wrongly. I, I'm, I, I feel responsible and very bad about this. I've told people, pray this prayer and you'll be saved. Well, that's not true. And it's made it so easy to become a Christian. And even be, if somebody says they're born again, doesn't mean that they are Christians. It just doesn't. And I think people at this point will sometimes say, have you forgotten? Has Clay forgotten about the Protestant Reformation, that we're not saved by our, our works? We're not saved by how good we are? For crying out loud, it looks like he's forgotten that. Uh, he thinks that we actually have to have a changed life. Well, yes, I do. And here, uh, by the way, are the first three theses of Martin Luther's 95 theses that he nailed to the Wittenberg door. And here they are. Our Lord and Master Jesus Christ will that the whole life of believers should be repentance. Uh, then secondly, this word cannot be understood to mean sacramental penance, that is confession and satisfaction, which is administered by the priests. Now here's the key, third thesis. Yet it means not inward repentance only, nay, there is no inward repentance which does not outwardly work diverse mortifications of the flesh. So if somebody says to me, well, guy, yeah, but I thought the Reformation was about you're not saved by your works. Absolutely. But you're not saved by your works. But the reformers had a phrase that I really like, and I've used it a lot. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. If your life isn't changed, if you're not now trying to please Jesus with your life, you're probably not saved, or you're just the most babyest kind of Christian, carnal Christian there is, but you're probably not saved. And uh, I'm going to, uh, I need to move this thing so I can read all this. I'll push this down here. Uh, the parable of the sower says, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Some other seed fell on the rocky ground where they did not have much soil and immediately sprang up. Uh, but since they had no depth of soil, when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30, and so on. Uh, so the rocky soil person, but notice something, the path, the seed that falls on the path, the sower isn't even trying to get seed on the path. Why not? Because he knows that the path is trodden on, it's as hard as a rock. The soil's not, it's not going to take a, it's not going to, uh, the seed's not going to be able to germinate. Uh, but there's a three then, three other kinds of soil. There's the rocky soil person and the weedy soil person. The rocky soil person doesn't have a deep root. And so when tribulation or persecution comes, they just say they give up Christianity. And the weedy soil person uh, is where it says, Jesus says, he explains, the cares of this world choke the message. But then notice that of the three types of soil, all three of them would say that they at one time had a conversion experience. But in Jesus' considered opinion, uh, two of the three soils were not capable of producing uh, fruit. Uh, there, it, the, 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 the wheat wasn't going to grow. And I think, so right off the bat, if you take that seriously, an awful lot of people who claim to have had conversion experiences aren't really Christians. But it gets worse. Um, for instance, we go to the parable of the wheat and, uh, and the weeds, uh, wheat and the weeds. Um, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while the men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, 
Then the weeds appeared also, and the servants of the master of the house came and said, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Then why does it have weeds? And the master replied, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to them, then do you want me to go and pull up the, the weeds? And the master said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow up together until harvest. At harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them into bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And the, the picture that you're seeing there uh, is of uh, bearded Darnell and wheat. The bearded Darnell from the left is number uh, one and three, and then you can't see very much because I cropped the picture so it would fit in better. And then the last one is also bearded Darnell. The wheat then from the left is two, four, and five. When the, but when the, the, the Darnell and the wheat are young, it's even harder to tell them apart. Once they really, the wheat really bears fruit, you know, really, you know, I mean, you can then easily identify which is which. But notice the point here. Jesus is saying that this, that Satan is actually sowing uh, his, his, his own seed, evil seed. And by the way, bearded Darnell is uh, poisonous. Uh, and so the devil sowing poisonous plants among the, in the Lord's good field, and these Plants are, you know, basically wolves in sheep's clothing. They will often self-identify as Christians, but they're not Christians. And people, I hear Christians ask me all the time, why do Christians do this or that? Or how come they've done so many terrible things and on and on and on? And the answer to that is what I write at the top there. Most Christians aren't. Most people who call themselves Christians aren't Christians. And, and we, that I realize for some Christians, that's hard to hear. By the way, this is very important. Notice Jesus says, do not gather up the weeds early. Wait until the last day. Why? Because you'll make a mistake. And what I've learned over the years is that I'm not qualified, spiritually qualified, to tell who is really a servant of Christ and who's a weed. I can't do it. Neither can I tell whether some is, whether some is, of the seed is on rocky soil uh, and doesn't really have a root or whether it's being choked by the cares of this world. I, I can't tell that either. So it's not our job until the Lord returns to say, well, this person's really not a Christian unless, and here's, and it's a big unless, unless that person uh, bears obvious, uh, say, if you will, satanic fruit uh, in, it's in their lifestyle or in their doctrine, uh, where it's just unambiguously that this, this person is teaching heresy, or this person is, you know, I mean, sleeping with uh, his girlfriend or his boyfriend or whatever it is, you know, where you, in an unrepentant manner where you go, this person just is, is clearly not saved. Uh, so, so we learn, as I mentioned, that Satan actually has his plants among true believers. And I'll tell you, I've encountered them uh, sometimes I've actually been able, because of the heresy they've espoused, been able to, you know, root them out. And sometimes I've been able to root them out church discipline wise when I found that they were, you know, uh, you know, the, this one woman was sleeping with members of the congregation. And I, uh, anyway, I basically kicked her out. Uh, and so there is a place where we can do that. But uh, anyway. So, and notice, I'll just, this is the last verse on this before we get into the Crusades, Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many, but the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Notice in Jesus' considered opinion, uh, most people aren't on the path that leads to righteousness, and they will not get into the kingdom. Okay. Well, I, I tell you all of this because obviously this sets the stage for a lot of the things that we're discussing for the rest of the evening, and that is just that an awful lot of people aren't, that call themselves Christians, they're just not Christians. And let me encourage you, uh, since I have just an opportunity here, make sure that you are walking with Jesus as you should be. Make sure you're keeping a clear conscience. I did a post, some of you may have seen on, you know, uh, sexual misconduct. Uh, and keeping a clear conscience that, you know, we need to be keeping a clear conscience, and your 
Jesus said, we love the phrase that says, you will know the truth and the truth will make, set you free. Non-Christians use it. In fact, I Googled just recently how many returns I would get on that phrase, and it was 850 million returns on you will know the truth and the truth will make you free or set you free. But what we ignore a lot of times is the first part of that verse is this. If you abide in my word, then you really are my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And so I challenge all of you, uh, and uh, you know, I don't know where you are on this in the Lord, how would I do that? Uh, but I just challenge all of you, make sure you're abiding in God's word and that it's informing how you should live. And you're trying to do what it says, because if you're not doing those things, you're, you're not a disciple. You may be a Christian that the Lord just hasn't shaped up yet, but you're certainly not a disciple if you're not doing those things. And so anyway, we have a lot of crazy people running around bearing the name of Christ who aren't Christians. And that brings us to the Crusades. Colorful graphics are good, especially when you're just talking to a camera for hours and, or looking into a monitor for hours. Uh, anyway, the Crusades, um, Professor Thomas Madden, uh, who has spent his life talk, teaching and writing on the Crusades, put it this way. He said, the Crusades are generally portrayed as a ser series of holy wars against Islam led by power mad popes and fought by religious fanatics. They're supposed to have been the epitome of self-righteousness and intolerance, a black stain on the history of the Catholic Church in particular and Western civilization in general. A, a breed of proto-imperialists, the Crusaders introduced Western aggression into the peaceful Middle East and then deformed the enlightened Muslim culture, leaving it in ruins. That is the general belief about the Crusades. That's just simply false. All of it's false. We'll be talking about that. Jonathan Riley Smith is a professor at Oxford, uh, wrote like 23 books on the Crusades, and he defines a crusade. He says, to contemporaries, a crusade was an expedition authorized by the Pope on Christ's behalf, which the leading participants in which took vows and consequently enjoyed the privileges of protection at home and the indulgence. The indulgence, by the way, is the problem because the indulgent was if you go off and fight in the crusade, you'll be saved. And that's where the mixing of works righteousness really began to occur uh, with grace. And, and it, that was bad. Um, uh, this is what Pope Urban actually preached in 1095. Pope Urban was the, the first crusade was in 1095. Pope Urban uh, did the preaching of the first crusade. Listen to what he himself uh, said. This is what he was telling people as why they should go on crusades. He says, the Muslims had invaded the lands of these Christian, those Christians and had depopulated them by the sword, pillage, and fire. It has led away part of the captives into its own country and a part it is destroyed by cruel tortures. It has either entirely destroyed the churches of God or appropriated them for the rights of its own religion. They destroy the altars after having defiled them with their uncleanness. They circumcise the Christians in, and the blood of the circumcision. They are either spread upon the altars or pour into vases of the baptismal font. When they wish to torture people by a base death, they perforate their navels, dragging forth the extremity of their intestines, bind it to a stake, and then flogging, they lead the victim around until the viscera, having gushed forth from the victim, falls prostrate upon the ground. Others they bind to a post. I have to move this, I can't. Uh, others they bind to a post and pierce with arrows. Others they compel uh, to extend their necks and then attacking them with naked swords, attempt to cut them through the neck with a single blow. What shall I say of the abominable rape of the women? To speak of it is worse than to be silent. The kingdom of Greeks is now dismembered by them and deprived of a territory so vast in extent that it cannot be traversed in a march of two months. On whom, uh, on whom, therefore, is the labor of avenging these wrongs and of recovering this territory, if not upon you? Uh, now, when I first started teaching on crusades was prior to ISIS. And it was a lot harder to get people to believe this stuff, to get the audience to actually believe this stuff. It was hard to believe that they were raping women, you know, I mean right and left, that they were dismembering people and torturing them, and they were tearing down all the churches. Now, with the advent of ISIS, and thankfully, largely its destruction, believe me, it's not completely gone, 
uh, I don't think there's any one of you right now that is that that sees what I've said here uh, and goes, no, they couldn't have done that. Surely that's not true. This is what Pope Urban preached to them in 1095. And we have no reason to believe that it's not true. I mean, of course it's true. I mean, like I say, ISIS has done basically all of this in just the last, well, like I say, they're largely destroyed now, but in the last few years, ISIS had done all of these things. Uh, and so we have no reason to not believe that this is what happened. Here's one of the big questions uh, that Christians had to ask. Christians were aware of the need to make sure that they were doing the right thing. Uh, and even though an awful lot of them weren't Christians, those who really were Christians took this very seriously. In uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 4, it says that the, of the government that he's God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger of God, uh, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And so the question is, is there such thing as a just war? And this was very important to the people who were alive during the first crusade. Is there such thing as a just war? To me, the answer to that is obvious and, and I think it's just simple. Of course, there's such a thing as a just war. What the picture that you're seeing there, probably every one of you recognizes or has an idea anyway of what it is. They, after uh, the uh, World War II ended, they brought a bunch of Germans from the cities around the, the uh, various death camps and they had them just gaze on the bodies of those that had been murdered. Uh, certainly World War II, in my opinion, and I'd be glad to argue this with anybody if you want, but it was certainly a just war, stopping Germany from, a quiet, from basically killing all the Jews in the world, from taking over the world, from tossing all the Bibles and replacing them with Mein Kampf, uh, subjecting all these countries, you know, uh, through force, certainly, if anything, was a just war. The World War II was a just war. And so, anyway, I, I mean, surely there are, and, and so then when it came to the Crusades, they asked the question, is this a just war? Augustine was the one who promulgated the first one to establish what we call just war theory. This is a little bit, you know, if you will, simplified, but here are three of the, the three major points for whether a war is just. Uh, it had to have a just cause, and that was to re recover property or to repel attack, check. Uh, certainly Muslims were not, they weren't, they, when they invaded Israel and countries like that, they didn't set up polling booths and ask, do you want to be a Jew, uh, or excuse me, do you want to be a Muslim, or do you want to be a Christian, or do you want to be a Jew? They didn't ask anybody's opinion. So this was definitely to recover property or to repel attack. Second, uh, a just war had to be called by the authority of a prince. In other words, a neighborhood can't call a just war. A church uh, can't call a just war, even a denomination. It has to be called by the government. Uh, and, and indeed, check again, uh, the government at the time agreed, we need to do something about this. And then the last one is right intention. And that is that the only way, the only means of achieving a justifiable purpose. In other words, if you could achieve the justifiable purpose, if you could sit down and talk with, you know, the Muslims and say, guy, you've taken our women, you've taken our property, you've taken our land. If you give it back, we'll just, you know, hey, we'll just call it a day. Uh, the Muslims weren't going to do that. So indeed, the only way of rectifying that was to go to war. And that's exactly what happened. So the Crusades were a just war. I quoted to you earlier Thomas Madden, and I like the way he puts it here. He says, now put this down in your notebook because it will be on the test. The Crusades were in every way a defensive war. They were the West's belated response to the Muslim conquest of fully two thirds of the Christian world. While the Arabs were busy in the seventh through 10th centuries, winning an opulent and sophisticated empire, Europe was defending itself against outside invaders and then digging out from the mess they left behind. Only in the 11th century were Europeans able to take much notice of the East. The event that led to the Crusades was the Turkish conquest of most of Christian Asia Minor, that is modern Turkey. The Christian emperor of Constantinople, faced with the loss of nearly half his empire, appealed to the rude but energetic Europeans. He got it. They came to his aid and thus that's what Thus the Crusades. 
Uh, but I like Madden saying, put this down on your notebook because it'll be on the test. The Crusades were a defensive war. Indeed, this was a response to Muslim aggression. Now, it is true that many Crusaders did horrible things, and they really did that drawing. I don't know who did that, but it's, it's good, just because they really did rape and pillage and plunder and murder. They murdered Jews. They murdered whoever they felt like uh, murdering and so on. I mean, that really did occur. Uh, but um, as Jonathan Wiley Smith of Oxford put it, most reputable Christian thinkers at the time never thought that someone's denial of Christian faith or the refusal to accept Christian government or the opportunity to con convert by force constituted just causes. They did not, the people, the, the leaders at the time did not think that you should convert a Jew by force. They did not believe that was to be true. Although that did happen, it's true. That was not a call of the Crusades. Um, uh, all too often, as I said, Crusaders did kill Jews, but no crusade was called against the Jews. In fact, as Thomas Madden put it, popes, bishops, and preachers made it clear that the Jews of Europe were to be left unmolested. Now, I've had some people say, yeah, but the Crusades were still really evil because of all the raping and pillaging and plundering. Well, I've got just a thought for you, and, and probably most of you don't know this because I didn't know this until some years ago. Um, uh, but at, when World War II ended, the Russians basically raped every woman in Germany, East Germany. I mean, they raped them all, uh, and they raped them again and again. At least they raped every woman that they wanted to rape. And they raped them again and again and again, uh, you know, from starting with a very young going to the old. They raped them again and again and again. Now, if you're, you may be thinking, well, I've never heard that. Well, Google it. Uh, Google's very powerful. You should try it sometime. But um, we don't say that the Russians shouldn't have resisted the Germans during World War II, because after the war, a lot of Russians were going to rape every German a woman in Germany, in East Germany anyway, we don't say, okay, that they should not have resisted them at all because of what they did later. Well, that's dumb. We don't, I mean, people don't think that. That would be a stupid argument. Uh, for instance, in Abu Ghraib, where a lot of our, some of our troops uh, got, got the Iraqi men naked and humiliated them, putting them in naked poses. Uh, we don't, Whatever you think about the war, the first war in Iraq, we don't judge that war based upon the fact that, that some of the people did that. That's not how you base a war. You base it upon was the call for it wise or not. And whether it was or not, what happened in Abu Ghraib, that's not the point. The My Lai massacre in Vietnam, same thing. Sure, some troops went off and massacred a lot of people, but that doesn't tell me anything about whether or not the, the Vietnam War was a good war, just war or not, it doesn't tell me that. And so, but most of the people in these, uh, most crusaders were not Christians. Here's a uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux. You're probably thinking, surprised that he doesn't look like a dog. But anyway, uh, for how, now he's preaching the second crusade, right? He says, for how long will your men continue to shed Christian blood? For how long will they continue to fight among themselves? You attack one another and slay one another and by it, you're, one another you are slain. What is this savage craving of yours? Put a stop to it now, for it is not fighting but foolery. So to risk both soul and body. It is not brave but shocking. It is not strength but folly. But now, O oh mighty soldiers, O oh men of war, you have a cause for which you can fight without danger to your souls, a cause for which to conquer is glorious and for which to die is gain. Well, for crying out loud, I mean, notice He's preaching, obviously, to a bunch of people that are killing each other, uh, who are doing all kinds of evil things to each other. He says, but now you can fight for Jesus. Well, that doesn't, obviously, an awful lot of these crusaders weren't Christians. In fact, uh, this is my fav favorite quote. There's a painting of Martin Luther. Uh, Martin, they were actually, the, 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 the Turks were actually attacking Germany. And now listen to what Luther said about it. He says, now that the Turk is actually approaching, and he meant Germany, even my friends are urging me to do this, especially there are, since there are some stupid preachers among us Germans, as I'm so sorry to hear, who are making the people believe that we ought not and must not fight against the Turk. But what motivated me most of all was this, the 
in the name of Christ and taught and incited men to do this as though our people were an army of Christians against the Turk who were enemies of Christ. This is absolutely contrary to Christ's doctrine and name. It's against his name because look at that. There are scarcely five Christians in such an army and perhaps there are worse people in the eyes of God in that army than there are the Turks. And yet they all want to bear the name of Christ. This is the greatest of all sins and is one that no Turk commits. For Christ's name is used for sin and shame and thus dishonored. Amen. Uh, but note, I, I, I don't know how to get, get any clearer than this. Martin Luther, who was alive while crusading was going on, goes, these people, most of these people aren't Christians. And that's just all there is to it. So let's sum this up. Truth is complex. Crusades went on for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. And by the way, it wasn't until 1948 that the, that the Muslims cared about the Crusades whatsoever. Did you hear what I said? Until 1948, 1949, Muslims didn't care about the Crusades at all. Why not? Because they thought they won the Crusades. What happened in 48? Uh, the United Nations got together and put Israel back in Palestine. Uh, now, all of a sudden, which there hadn't been for a couple thousand years, now there's actually a country named Israel. The Crusaders had won. And now as Muslims are watching uh, the West do so well and they've seen their lands lost and they, they're not, they're, they've lost in almost every type of competition, economic, political or whatever, it's actually causing the Muslims to have an existential crisis. Is Islam true? That's what has led to the tremendous amount of terrorism that you've seen in the last two decades. Uh, Anyway, so truth is complex. Most Christians aren't Christians. Indulgences were corrupt, and warring in Christ's name was corrupt. Uh, but the question is, is it right? When is it right to stop violent aggression? Uh, and I'll tell you something, in my opinion, stopping the, the Muslims was right to stop Muslim aggression. And when 9-11 occurred, I didn't know anybody that didn't think that we needed to go and bomb the crud out of the Muslim countries, uh, well, in particular, Afghanistan, uh, and he, that, that started this. Um, uh, here's my, sh people come up, like even my, uh, uh, I have a relative that came up to me, says, well, yeah, but the Crusades were so bad. And I said, aren't you glad that Italy and Spain, and for that matter, all of Europe aren't today under Muslim control? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I am. Well, that was the cost. And what stopped that was the Crusades. It was the Crusades that stopped basically all of Europe from being under Muslim control. So anyway, uh, I'm now going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, and, and before I get into the second half of the, my talk, I thought I'd give you a chance to ask some questions or make some comments, but you're going to need uh, to unmute your mic. So you said <clears throat> Afghanistan. Why Afghanistan? Why not Saudi Arabia? Uh, be, because we, they traced Al Qaeda to Afghanistan. Uh, that's, that was, that was where it was traced to, it was traced to Al uh, Afghanistan. In fact, in, in uh, Pakistan, which of course borders Afghanistan, has been the cause of there being so many horrors in Afghanistan, because what they did, that Al Qaeda would just run back and hide in, in Pakistan. And this has just gone on for years, but that's the reason that we attacked Afghanistan is because that's where we traced the World Trade Center bombing too. Hmm. I thought the all the hijackers were Saudi. Oh, they were, but uh, at least the majority of them were. But but uh, again, and honestly, we should have done. We isn't we want, isn't uh, wasn't we need to go ahead. Wasn't, wasn't Osama uh, Saudi? Yes, he was. But again, though, they dis, in their opinion, the real call for all of this, uh, like a lot of these people, a lot of the, what was generating this was going on in, in Afghanistan. Uh, I do agree with you that we should have taken more action against the Saudis, though, but they are, as Bill Maher put it one day to uh, a guy, but there are friends, uh, which we need them to help us, and so we don't attack them. But you bring up a very legitimate point, frankly, Chris. Uh, but but uh, anyway, but 
it's not really worth the to our time on, on figuring out why the United States of America spent so much time focused only on Afghanistan. They certainly, Afghanistan was such a backward country. Saudi, who we get our oil from and stuff that at the time was that was going to be a lot harder. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have done it. I'm just saying that's just not really the point of this conversation. Yeah, I get it. Anybody else? <clears throat> Looks like there's some questions in the chat box here. Okay, um, I don't see the chat box, so you'll have to read them to okay, me. What so, you think is okay, worthy? Carla, Carla Brown is asking if you're willing to share your slides. Uh, uh oh, am I willing to? Uh, you know, uh, I have to think. The trouble is, is I don't own a lot of the images, and I'm trying to walk a thin line there because. Uh, you can get the images. I, I'm willing to share with, you know, for instance, when it comes to the Crusades, by the way, if you, I've written a blog entitled The Truth About the Crusades. And when I first put this blog up, it had like 200 visitors. And then Barack Obama got up and talked about, well, the Crusaders were just as bad as Islam. And all of a sudden, like in just, a, just three or four days, the amount of visitors went from 200 visitors to to my blog to 1.4 thousand to 1400 visitors in like two days. Uh, mm -hmm. But everything that I've said here, I mean like everything uh, and even more you can find in my blog, The Truth About the Crusades. When it comes to the pictures, use Google images. Uh, you'll find similar pictures and, and but I'd f I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be on, say, on good moral ground to share them since I don't have the right to a lot of the images. Okay. And I can read this one. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I won't make you do it. Um, I, it's a rambly question. Hopefully it gives you an idea of where I'm going. Um, my question is, what is the difference between sins? Um, or really, how can we distinguish between like acceptable evils and bad sins, quote unquote? So like you mentioned, like sleeping around is bad, but certain kinds of violence or lying may be acceptable. Um, why is violence acceptable for uh, the Christian who is supposed to lay down his life for his enemy? And is there any like philosophical precedent for these kind of distinctions? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I, I've got to say, um, this thing's bugging my ear, but um, I've got to say one of the big troubles with this whole conversation is that, uh, well, can the government, in other words, I as a Christian don't have the right to be violent to my neighbor for any reason. I don't have the right to be violent. Can the government uh, decide that they're going to stop certain sor sorts of aggression? Uh, for instance, because this isn't just an army, this, can, this goes down to a police force. Can a government have a police force that's going to punish the wicked? I think the government can have a police force that's going to punish the wicked. I think it can. I think it should. Uh, and so, uh, but I, as a Christian, no, I, I can't be violent to anybody, not at all. But the government can, who may or may not be supported by Christians, it doesn't really matter, can stop violent people from acting out their violent ways. And, and in fact, I think we'd all agree that they should. Because boy, if you don't think the government should stop violent people, wait and tell the somebody's at your door uh, and wants to break it down. I mean, who, what you gonna do? I mean, um, and so I'm glad they're, I'm all for a strong police force, I'm for government. But so anyway, no, we, we, we personally, I can't personally, uh, you know, start righting wrongs <laughs> with violence, but our, my, um, our government can. And I think that's what it's teaching again in, in uh, first uh, in Romans chapter 13. You mean uh, offensive or uh, or if someone breaks through the window? Well, that's a little, I can, that's something I think every Christian is going to need to figure out on, on having a clear conscience. I think we misunderstand, for instance, Jesus said, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Uh, that's talking about insults and grievances, legal grievances and things like that. Uh, Jesus didn't say, he could have, but he didn't say, if anybody rapes your wife, let him have your daughter also. He could have said that. And then we would all, if we were going to follow Jesus, we would all necessarily have to be pacifists because that would be indeed a strong call to pacifism. 
um, I, I'm just going to have to leave it to the individual Christians thing. If somebody breaks into your house and they're coming after you and you sit there and say, you know, I mean, let's just use like the hillside strangler or whatever. And you recognize, you know, and I mean, they come into your house and you know, they're going to strangle your wife and daughter. Do you have the right before God to use force to stop them? I think you probably do. But um, what we're really talking about here is the ability for a government to use force in either an army or in a police force to stop evil. Do we have a, I'm sorry if someone else is free for me. Go ahead. Anybody else? And we'll, we'll give you another chance, Chris, if there isn't anybody else. I had Hello. a question. Oh. I'll let Lakoff go first. Um, so my mom um, is 85 years old and had prayed a prayer with me. I tried to cover all the bases. Yep, the prayer. And I've been reading the Bible to her and she listens to hymns. There's, there's not a lot of spiritual hunger. Um, would, you, would you question her then? You mean, would I ask her questions? No. Uh, would, would you say that that wasn't? I, you know, it, it's not up to me. As I said, I can't tell who's really a, who really is a Christian and who isn't. I can't tell. Uh, I would just do your best, Carla, to keep encouraging her to walk with Jesus. You might ask her though, you can, if you're in a position, since you've been talking to her about spiritual things, I think you're in a position to ask her, you know, what do you think about this? You know, what do you think about Jesus and, and so on? I mean, you can ask her, but I, I wouldn't put myself in the position of saying whether she was a Christian or not. Uh, but I do think though, you know, as the scripture says, test your, Paul says in second Corinthians, end of second Corinthians, he says, test yourself to see if you really are in the faith. Uh, and so, uh, I, I, other than that, I'm afraid I don't have a, a really good answer. This one of the, what you're bringing up is one of the most difficult things that I have to deal with. And that, and it's something that I feel very deeply is having to de deal with people where I go, I'm not sure they're Christians or not. And that's very troubling to me, but all I can do is my best in communicating the gospel to them as I'm guessing that you have done. And then you know, we'll see where it goes, but the, ultimately the response is up to them. It, it's just hard, um, you know, because. Oh, it is hard. Um, when, when people are older, there's not, it, some people just have more of a simple faith and right. it's, it's not incredibly, you know, it's kind of like people are given 10 talents or five talents or one talent, you know, and not right. everybody gets like this <clears throat> and they have this passionate, full-blown running hard after jesus right away you know so oh, i understand completely how old is she by the way 85 yeah well we will see you know i mean uh uh all i can encourage is just pray and as you get the opportunity to talk to her about it I, there's just you know i mean she will make the decision in her heart on whether how seriously she wants to take this it's it, I, I wish there was a simple answer i have relatives that i, I worry about and I pray about, and I don't know really where they are or not, but all I can do is just, you know, do my best to encourage them in Jesus. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anybody else? One question. Uh, so, but, okay, uh, um, it's, it's some of the crusades, but I know there's some people who are willing to die uh, and kill for Jesus Christ and also their own country. Uh, are they Christians or it's like a huge gray area? Well, again, one of the things is, is that I'm not in a, we're not in the place to be able to tell between the wheat and the tares, the, the wheat and the bearded Darnell, which is poisonous. Uh, you know, uh, some of these people are clearly not Christians. The only way you can ever really tell is if they actually like cross the line. For instance, if somebody's shacking up uh, with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and, and they're just not repent at all, I would challenge them on their Christianity. And I have done exactly that. Uh, I don't understand. There's a lot of people call themselves Christians in this generation that are sexual atheists. And uh, it's bizarre to me. And it's needs something we need to confront, by the way. Uh, and, you know, I mean, you can't sin, right? We're all, everybody's a sinner. And I'm not talking about that people aren't going to sometimes commit sexual sins. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those who are unrepentant. In other words, they're not trying to stop it. They're not trying to fix it. Those individuals 
probably aren't. In fact, I would tell them they weren't Christians. I had when I was a youth pastor. This is, dates me back in 1983. Uh, this is just. In fact, it was 1983. We didn't really know about AIDS, and that's just when we began to hear about AIDS. It was 1983. But this woman in my, uh, you know, in one of the groups I was leading, a young woman came up to me and she says, "Clay, I'm picking up men at bars and having sex with them, and I'm having the time of my life." Uh, to make a long story short, and I said, "And if Jesus comes back, I don't think you'll be saved." Uh, she went up to my wife the next week and she says, he really made a lot of sense to me and I stopped doing that. And she, by the way, I then some a year or two later performed her marriage and she actually went off and sent her children to Biola. Uh, but uh, somebody needed to tell her, you're, you're, this is not, you're not saved. You can't live in unrepentant sin and be saved. You can't. And I don't care whether it's unrepentant lying or unrepentant, uh, you know, promiscuity. You can't do that and, and be saved. Yeah, but uh, what about, you know, dying for a country, like, you know, like, you know, guy whack, uh, again, do some war stuff and go home, still be a Christian. Like, well, that, can you uh, be yeah. a sir? Can you serve in the police force or the armed services of the, let's just, because we're in this country, the United States. Well, I, well, not everybody here is, but anyway, yeah, I think you can. Uh, you can fight for your country as a Christian. And a lot of Christians have had to weigh this out. Uh, C.S. Lewis does an article on this, like it's entitled Christianity in Wartime. And he certainly thinks that it's okay to go to war to stop unjust uh, aggression. So uh, yeah, I think you could be a soldier and go to war for your country for a just cause. Sure. <clears throat> Understand. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Sure, I got one. Okay. Um, <laughs> I just lost it. Um, oh, you said uh, if a prince calls the war, let's say our government calls the war, but we um, we decide that it's an unjust war. All right. Are, should we disobey the government order to go? I think if, if you, the, you know, I mean, obviously the line can get pretty blurry, but if I think, I think if it got to the point where you said, this is just wrong, then I think it would be <clears throat> right for you to disobey and not go. That's my opinion. Okay. Fair enough. Anyone else? Because I need to get on to the next topic. I'll tell you what. I'm going to, you're going to be able to ask me more questions in a minute. So why don't I get back onto the, the next two topics and then I will open it up for questions again and we'll move on. And I think we are here, share, and that should be right. Moving on to, wait a minute, how come this isn't moving? Hmm. Oh, there we go. Moving on to the subject of slavery. Uh, I'm not going to talk too long about slavery, but obviously this is one of the great evils of the Western world. Uh, everybody in that that is that's paying it, being a part of this, I'm sure, has seen the the dot drawing of the, how they put people on slave ships. That's horrendous. Uh, of course, many who called themselves Christians misused the Bible to justify New World slavery, and in a minute I'll explain why. Uh, you can't justify new world slavery. You just can't. But anyway, uh, Sam Harris said, while the abolitionists of the 13th century were morally right, they were on the losing side of a theological argument. As a Reverend Richard Fuller put it in 19, 1845, what God sanctioned in the Old Testament and permitted in the New cannot be a sin. The good Reverend was on firm ground here. Nothing in Christian theology remedies the appalling deficiencies of the Bible on what is perhaps the greatest and easiest moral question our society has ever had to face. Well, I don't agree with that at all. We'll talk about that. Um, you know, the scripture does teach slaves to be subject to their masters and everything, to try to please them, not to tuck back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they are, can be fully trusted, and so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. Why, you know, if slavery is so bad, and, and well, new world slavery is clearly a sin. Ancient slavery is not that simple, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, 
Certainly slaves in New Testament times were often harshly treated, but the New Testament condemns that unambiguously. Slaves were to be treated well, Colossians 4.1. Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Also, well-treated slaves were often better off than non-slaves. Uh, you know, I mean, th this is throughout the world, uh, uh, in the ancient world anyway, definitely the case. In, in the ancient world, slaves were often treated bell, better than the non-slaves because non-slaves didn't have anyone to protect them. But here's the biggest thing about the slavery issue when it comes to ancient slavery. Jesus was not primarily about changing outward systems. Jesus' proclamation was primarily about freeing people from the worst master of all, which is sin. That's what Jesus is about, is about freeing people from the worst master of all, which is sin. So the question occurs, why doesn't the Bible clearly oppose all slavery? And Dallas Willard, USC philosopher, now the, died a few years ago, he said the revolution of Jesus is in the first place and continuously a revolution of the human heart or spirit. It did not and does not proceed by means of the formation of the social institutions and laws, the outer forms of our existence, intending that these would impose a good order of life upon people who come under their power. Rather, his is a revolution of character, which proceeds by changing people from the inside through ongoing personal relationship to God in Christ and to one another. External social arrangements may be useful to this end, but they are not the end, and they are not, nor are they a fundamental part of the means. I think this is exactly correct. When Christianity came, when Jesus brought Christianity to the to you know Israel and then the Roman Empire and so on, um, he wasn't trying to change outward institutions. He wasn't interested in changing outward institutions. That doesn't mean that he didn't think that outward institutions were corrupt, but that's not what he came to change. He came to change people's hearts. Uh, and we, once we begin to understand this, we'll see why a Christianity didn't just say, you know, the first thing we need to do is stop all slavery. And like I say, in ancient times, slaves were actually treated better uh, in Israel for sure than non-slaves were because non-slaves were subject to, they didn't have anybody to take care of them. Thus, Paul says, were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you, although if you can gain your freedom, do so. Notice Paul's saying, and this is something that honestly a lot of Christians just have a hard time getting a hold of, that your outward circumstances are not very important. And a lot of Christians really struggle to get a hold of this. Uh, and honestly, it's because they do not read the Bible enough and they're in love with this present world. And so they cannot understand how their outward circumstances couldn't be of the utmost importance. But what's really important is that you will be freed from sin and then will have eternal life with Jesus. That's what's really important. So he goes on, says, for who he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's free man. Similarly, he who is a free man when he is called is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price at a price, so do not become slaves. So here, what Paul is saying is that really what we need to do is free people from their bondage to the master called sin. That's what they need to be freed from, because if they're freed from that, even if they're in chains, they are now the Lord's freed man. You are free in Jesus, even if you are treated poorly by your master. Uh, similarly, uh, the other hand is, you could be a free man, in other words, not be a slave or a woman, but if you don't know Jesus, you are in slavery to the worst master of all, sin, who always kills and will ultimately see you sent off to eternal punishment. And so, this is what we've got to get through related to this, and maybe this will help. And some of you have been my students, and you've heard me say this. Your, and, and this is so related to all this, and you really need to think this through. Your physical um, death is not very important. And I, I, I've said that to so many people, and I think people go, well, yeah, well, it's important to me. Yeah, well, I get that. But it, in the big scheme of things, it shouldn't be that important to you. Jesus said, do not fear him who can kill the body, but after that has nothing more than he could do to you. 
but fear him who after the body is killed can cast a soul into hell. Jesus says, yes, I tell you, fear him. And I see, I hear that and I go, I get it, Lord Jesus. I need to fear you. Uh, what men can do to me, even if it's if they ins if physically were to enslave me or imprison me, even let's say for being a Christian or whatever, even if they do those things to me, as long as I am freed in Jesus and I'm going to live eternally with Jesus, that's not very important. And so it, I really encourage every one of you to take seriously what Jesus says, do not fear him who can kill the body and has after that has nothing more to do. Fear him who after the body is killed and cast a soul into hell, he says, I tell you, fear him. That's who you really need to fear. Now, now let's just keep moving on here. Um, uh, Jesus said, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a, is a slave to sin. Thus, the non-Christian free man is a slave to the worst master of all sin who always kills. The Christian is free even if he or she is physically enslaved. Now, like I, I honestly... Only true Christians are going to understand this. Non-Christians and quasi-Christians and what are going to, I don't know what he's talking about, because what could be worse than being a slave? Uh, all I can say is being a slave to sin is what's worse. Now, I'm in no way in saying that slavery, uh, American slavery, was not a terrible thing that had to end. It, it was and it did. Uh, but that's, but compared to being under the master sin and being in bondage to the master sin and therefore going potentially going to hell forever that's much worse than being physically enslaved but again only those who have an actual comprehension of that human life is not first and human life is about eternal life it's not about this life human life is not about earthly life it's about the life to come but we have just the hardest time grasping this. And honestly, we need to, it's because we're in love with the world most of the time. Uh, Christians have been at the forefront of fleeing, uh, freeing the slaves. That's William, painting of William Wilberforce, who was the leader of the abolitionist movement in England. Uh, they freed the slaves uh, long before that happened in the United States. Uh, although this book is now maligned, Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe had a lot to do with freeing the slaves. Here's how the book ends. Uh, and what she was trying to do was to show the horror of slavery in America. That's what Uncle Tom's Cabin was about, was about showing the horror of slavery in America. And her book did that. Uncle Tom's Cabin succeeded. And more than any other single thing, Uncle Tom's Cabin led to the Civil War because the people that were reading it went, we just can't let this go on. This has to stop. And so this is how the, her book ends. A day of grace is yet held out to us. Both North and South have been guilty before God, and the Christian church has a heavy account to answer, not by combining together to protect injustice and cruelty and making a common capital of sin as a union to be saved, but by repentance justice and mercy for not sure is the eternal law by which the millstone sinks in the ocean than the stronger law by which injustice and cruelty shall bring nations on the wrath shall bring on nations the wrath of almighty god that book had more to do her you know i mean she was a christian her saying you know what you're going to be judged by god and this is terrible it's what is really what led to the end of new world slavery now the Bible opposes New World slavery, by the way. Why do I say that? Because New World slavery was based first and foremost on man stealing. Uh, here's a couple of verses that you don't hear a lot in this conversation. Deuteronomy 23, 15, if a slave has taken refuge with you, do not hand him over to his master. That's not a very, you know, I mean, believe me, in the antebellum South, you would be a really bad guy if you didn't hand over a slave. But this is the most important verse of all, really. Exodus 21, 16. He who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he is found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. And new world slavery was about stealing people or kidnapping them. So that's unequivocally condemned by the scripture. Now, ancient slavery, you became a slave in two major ways. Uh, you were, the, the, the biggest one was, is you were uh, a combatant, an enemy combatant, 
uh, in what they considered, of course, this is if you, but considered to be an unjust warrior, an enemy combatant. And what they would do is capture you and enslave you instead of just simply return you. They couldn't just send you back to the battlefield, right? They couldn't just send you back to your country because what would happen then? You'd just come back and try to kill them the next day. So as opposed to just killing everybody they captured, they considered it relatively humane to enslave people who went to war against them. And that's where the, uh, an awful lot of slaves came from. But see, this is not kidnapping people. This is capturing people in a, that you are actually in physical combat with, and you can't re-release -re them kill you tomorrow. The other major way that people became slaves in the ancient times is they had accrued debts they couldn't pay and they were in, and they were put into slavery until they could pay it. Now I'm not saying this is okay. That's not the point. I'm just saying, but this was not man stealing. This was not anyway, this was not man stealing. But new world slavery was based almost entirely on man stealing. And I, I, we just, anyway, we just have to come to grips with this. this. So the idea that new world slavery wasn't sinful, it was absolutely sinful. In fact, if you look at the verse in Exodus 21, it says those who do that should be put to death. So, uh, you know, I, anyway, I just, this is just crazy. In 1 Timothy 1.10, the law was made for adulterers and perverts and slave traders and liars and perjurers. Notice that slave traders is put in with perverts and adulterers and liars and perjurers. Uh, so anyway, uh, is, let me just give you a couple of thoughts about this, because one of the things, and I did a blog on this, is Christianity a white male religion? That's in Lagos, Africa. Uh, and uh, a few things for you to consider. People have said to me, well, Clay, this is, must be wonderful for you because you're a, a male, a white male, and Christianity is a white Western male religion. And I've pointed out, and some of you may have heard me say this, but if you look at a map, map, shock and awe, you're going to find that Christianity is actually a Middle Eastern religion. Also, as Paul Marshall has pointed out, Christianity was in Africa before Europe, India before England, China before America. Three fourths of world Christians live in the third world. Uh, China, you know, um, Mar I said China before America. Then I have it again. Oh, well, I'll have to fix it. Uh, that's an understatement since there are about, oh, I see. Marshall said China before America. That's an understatement since there are Christian tombstones in China dated no lot later than 86 uh, CE, Christian era or common era, whatever you want to call it, AD. Uh, in other words, we know that Christianity got to China in the first century. Uh, also, more people attended Christian services last Sunday in China than in every country of Europe combined. Add England, France, Spain, Germany, Portugal, Sweden, Netherlands, Norway, on and on and on. Add them all together. More people attended Christian services last Sunday in China than in every one of those countries combined. Uh, China is now on track to have the world's largest population of Christians by 2030. And this isn't also only true of China. People attended Christian services last Sunday uh, it, more people attended Christian services last Sunday in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, they dwarf church attenders in Europe. This is also true for South America. The large majority of people who attend Christian services in the world, uh, oops, went the wrong way, uh, are not white. More women are Christians throughout the world than are men. And this is not because women make up a larger percentage of the world's population than do men. Uh, further, even in the United States, the Pew Research Center says that African Americans self-identify as Christians more often than do whites. Thus, Christianity is not a white man's religion. Instead, when you put it all together, and I like to kid people with this, uh, I'm thankful that I'm the adherent of a non-white third world female religion. So anyway, the conclusion, although the Bible doesn't condemn every kind of slavery, it does condemn, command owners to treat their slaves well, and well-treated slaves often fared better in ancient times than free men. But the Bible does unambiguously condemn kidnapping, and that was the basis of New World slavery. So I'm going to leave that and move on to the oppression of women so we can keep going here, and then I'll uh, take a break and take your questions. Uh, another thing that you hear Christians accused of is being a, that Christianity is oppressive to women. Let's give this some thought. That looks very oppressive there, by the way. Christianity is the liberator of women. It was because of Christian influences, by the way, that the practice of sate in India was stopped because of Christian influences, where when they burned, when a guy died, when, when the, the husband died, they burned his body on a pyre and they put his uh, living wife on the pyre and she burned to death with her husband. 
Christians influences stopped that in India. <clears throat> it was Christians who stopped the public defloration of virgins in Samoa. Uh, the book Coming of, Samoa, of Age in Samoa by Margaret Mead is the most famous anthropological work of all time. And um, Margaret Mead pro portrayed Samoa as just being this wonderful time of fun and happiness and the the kids are out there having sex with each other and it was just wonderful. Not just simply not true. In fact, virgins were publicly deflowered, which uh, means that their vaginas were publicly opened uh, before they got married. Uh, Christians stopped that in Samoa. Foot binding in China, a lot of that, what it was the Christian influences that largely stopped foot binding in China. That was because of Christian influences. Female genital mutilation or female genital cutting. Uh, Christians are, of course, desperately opposed to this. You know, well, I can't see your faces anyway, really. And, and since you're all in your own rooms, I can speak freely and you don't have to worry. But, uh, you know, uh, this is really, you know, obviously bad. I, I, Muslims, I actually, Muslims and some non Muslim African uh, tribes uh, are for, you know, the female genital mutilation. And it can be very small. Uh, in fact, it's, some of you may have even been in class. I, I had two women in my class one day when I was teaching the on uh, the distance version at Talbot. And uh, one of them was an MD that actually practiced in Africa. And uh, another one was a, a woman became a friend of hers. Actually, the two of them became friends, actually had a adopted a little boy that was uncircumcised. Well, anyway. The MD says, you know, now uh, they're saying that uh, female genital cutting or mutilation is uh, uh, the same as male circumcision. That's dumb. That's very, that's just absolutely positively ridiculous. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is some value to male circumcision, which if you want, I'll explain why it's just less infection and whatnot. But but that's not really the point right now. The point is, uh, it's Christianity that is out to try and stop this from happening. Christian influences. Muslims, actually, a lot of Muslim groups absolutely do not oppose it. Um, but what about the Western liberated woman? Uh, and this is where, uh, and I honestly, I feel sorry for women. I really do. And here's why. By the way, that, that medallion there that you could wear around your neck was put out by the National Organization of Women women and what it stands for that is that if a, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Uh, they just don't, women really don't need men. Well, that's dumb. Um, I would point out to you that most Christians support a woman's right to vote, freedom from harassment, equal pay for equal work, freedom of association, freedom of thought, conscience and religion to an equal education, maternity rights, work leave, prenatal health care, and so on and on and on. Uh, Really, Christians are all for uh, women being not being oppressed. Is really, really what what it comes down to, and you know this. It really comes down to abortion. Uh, that that really now, when it comes to to the women's liberation movement or feminism, it's about abortion. Well, yeah, Christians oppose abortion because it's actually taking an innocent person's life. Uh, but as society, by the way continues to cast off Christian morality, it increasingly oppresses women. Uh, as I said, the women's liberation movement is now about sexual liberation primarily, uh, which is now taken for granted, and the ability then to dispose of unwanted children. Uh, that's because that's, you got to liberate. Women can't be equal to men if they can't control when they're going to have kids, you see, because if they can't sleep around like a man sleeps around, if they can't sleep around without having to worry about, you know, well, I could end up getting pregnant. See, if they have to worry about that, then they can't be equal to a man. And so as a result, abortion is the cause celeb uh, for the, you know, for feminism today, because that's the only way in their minds that women can be in any sense equal to men. Uh, <clears throat> Strangely, along the, these lines, uh, women are told that being naked in porn is actually empowering. That's crazy town. Uh, 
And uh, in fact, there's this gal, I don't remember her name, but she was a porn star. In fact, she, in fact, she was the Maxim porn star of the year. Uh, and uh, she, was, she became a Christian and is now crusading against pornography, but she was at, she was on a show like The View, you know, The View, and she was on a, and they asked her, but didn't you find pornography empowering? And she laughed. She thought that was hilarious. She said, no, I didn't find it empowering. <clears throat> but you, that's where, see, but <clears throat> the women's liberation, the feminism needs to be able to say, you can just be just like a man. And if you want to take off your clothes and get naked and do whatever, that's great because you're, you're just like men. I got to have some water. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Excuse me. Anyway, uh, the women are getting increasingly oppressed in the West. Playboy started in 1953. Then there was Penthouse Hustler. Satellite TV was 76. In 1977, you had VCRs. Um, by 1992, 490 million adult videos had been rented. 1998, one in five people had genital herpes. In 2002, 65 million Americans were, had incurable STDs. By 2003, one, there were 1.3 million commercial porn sites. 2004, 42% of all visitor to adult sites, visitors to adult sites are women. Uh, in 2009, if you Googled the word, word porn, there were 220 million returns in 2012. There was 1 billion 660 million. And no, I didn't bother Googling 2021, but I'm sure the returns are just astronomical. Uh, but what's happened is, and my where I'm going with all this is to say that the liberated feminist is oppressive, that what they're doing by saying, hey girls, have sex with whoever you want whenever you want, you want to get naked, not a problem. It's, you know, I mean, you have nothing to be ashamed of, go out and do it, that this is actually oppressive to women because porn makes men then want their wives or girlfriend to look and act like porn stars and liberated women hear and obey. I tried to find a rather tame cover of Cosmopolitan. Uh, this one's pretty tame, but notice the titles on it be a sex genius, uh, you know, I mean, double his pleasure and yours, uh, 50 things guys wish you knew. Um, I'm not going to read that one. Uh, the, anyway, I, I mean, notice then a special section, if men edited Cosmo, uh, and so on. Notice that Cosmo is an awful lot about telling women how they can please men. I thought it was about being free from men. No, Cosmo is about telling you how to please men. But the trouble is too, because sex is a powerful motivator, porn makes women less valuable to men, which is alters the balance of power between the sexes. What I, I hope you're understanding this. Well, let me put it very bluntly, which of course is the way I tend to roll. A uh, hundred and say, let's say a hundred years ago, not even that long. Um, in fact, 1953, before 1953 in the publication of Playboy, if a man wanted to see a woman naked, he pretty much had to marry one. And, and I had a gal come up to me, some of you in, that are watching this probably know who this gal is because she's a graduate of our program. But she came up to me before, she's now married, she came up to me before she was, got married. She says, she says, men are immature. And I was like, huh, that's a very interesting comment to make. Men are immature. And I thought about that for a while. And I thought they are immature because think about it. If it used to be, let's say that if a man wanted to see a woman naked and men like that, by the way, uh, that if a man wanted to see a woman naked, he pretty much had to marry one. Uh, and, but for him to marry one, the, the man had to be going someplace. He couldn't just simply be living in his mom's basement and not have you know any kind of a job because no woman was gonna marry a guy that was living in his mom's basement. But now that man doesn't have to get a job and move out of his mom's basement to have sex with a woman or at the very least to see one naked. And as a result, they don't need women as much as they use, men don't need women as much as they used to. And also they're not growing up as they used to. See, I, I know people are gonna, 
this will blow some of your minds. I got married uh, when I was 18 years old. Uh, and I know some of you are probably, whoa. Uh, I got married, Jean was 19. Uh, I was 18, she was, I was almost 19, she was almost 20. But I got married as an 18 year old, but believe me, I was going someplace. Uh, you know, I had my play, my life mapped out. I was going to finish college and get my master of divinity and go on, on and on. See, I was travel. I was traveling someplace. I was going someplace. Uh, now, if somebody said they were going to get married at 18, you'd do an intervention. You'd sit them down and go, we're, we're going to have to do an intervention here because you're a stupid person. But people were mature, more mature. See, back Back when I got married, honestly, to get married at 18, 19, 20 years old was not that unusual. My sister did, as a matter of fact, and by the way, her marriage has continued on. I'm still married to, to the woman I married as a teenager. I mean, uh, in fact, we're, it's gonna be 46 years in June. Uh, my sister, she got married, I think when she was 19 or 20, she's still married to her husband. My brother got married just a little later, about, I think he was 22. 21, 22, but still people would go, there's no way that's not, you're not ready. But we were, we were getting our acts together. We weren't living in our mom's basement. So anyway, but pornography and free sex is changing the balance of power for the, against the women. It's causing them to be oppressed and women liberated to have sex before marriage often find themselves abandoned because men don't need to marry them to get sex. <sighs> yeah. You know, a woman came up to me one day this is before I was working at, I was still working in the insurance industry. And she says, she said, that, and I'm pretty blunt with people. And she says that she'd been living with her boyfriend for five years and no kidding. And you probably won't be that surprised now, but I looked at her and I said, well, he's not going to buy the cow if he gets the milk for free. No, I'm not saying she's a cow. That's dumb. I'm saying that if she gives away what he wants most for free, He's not going to, she, he's not going to marry her because he doesn't have to, because he can just use her and lose her. And in fact, that's what he did. About eight or nine months later, she came up to me and said, he left me. Well, there you go. Um, because men get sex without responsibility, women find many men are not maturing. Well, I already talked about that. Then a lot of women are feeling oppressed because they have guilt over their abortions. I mean, you may be able to lie to yourself that it's just a clump of cells, but really down in your heart of hearts, you know, you've killed it. You've killed a human person. Um, women are told another women, way that women are oppressed now in the West is that they're, they're told that just being a wife and a mom is beneath them. So they need to try to have it all. And indeed, there's a book by Helen Gurley Brown, who was, by the way, for years, the editor in chief of Cosmopolitan. Uh, she entitled her book, Having It All, Success, Sex, Love, Marriage, Money. I mean, you can have it all. Um, this is uh, Sheryl Sandberg. Some of you know who she is. She's the COO of Facebook. She wrote a book called Lean In. And basically her premise was women need to work harder. You need to be out in the workforce. You need to hold down a full-time job. Yeah, fine to have kids and a husband and all that. But if you're not accomplishing enough, you need to work harder. Well, wow. That's, you know, see, that's... Some a lot of women have to work. I get it. My wife had to work for a long time. She doesn't anymore. Praise God. But uh, well, this quote here, I don't remember who did this. I can give you the quote later if you want. Uh, some somebody wrote up about her. Miss Sandberg makes her engagement and parenting clear in her TED talk. And you can, if you Google TED talk uh, and Cheryl Sandberg, you'll see this. She says first when she describes her daughter, who's three, at preschool doing that whole hugging the leg, crying, "Mommy, don't get on that plane thing." which discounts your child's experience by calling it a thing. I mean, see, this is oppressive to women. And now talk about oppressive is this is getting worse. Uh, this woman is sitting in a planet fitness locker room and a guy sits and she's changing her clothes and a guy sits down next to her who's just in regular street clothes. She goes and complains, planet fitness kicks her out of Planet Fitness revokes her membership for complaining that a guy sat down in street clothes next to her while she was changing her clothes. Hello, this, what's happening, what you're seeing is you're seeing the oppression of women by the feminists and the, the liberated people are oppressing women. Uh, this is another example, this whole transgender thing. Somebody, the first day Biden took office, he signed a thing saying, uh, 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 not an edict, 
Anyway, you can tell me when we do the Q&A, but he signed something saying that there's no biological, that the government will recognize no biological difference between males and females. That's oppressive. One person put it, he has erased women with a stroke of the pen. Uh, the, the, the person on the, the entity on the left is named Fallon Fox. Fallon Fox is a you know, mixed martial arts fighter who was, I don't know, I get all confused on this, but uh, was, is a guy who decided to become a female. The, the gal on the right fought her, Tamika Brents. Uh, Fallon Fox beat the stuffing out of Tamika Brents, uh, broke her eye socket. Tamika later said, I have, I, you know, you can imagine that Tamika as an MMA fighter, a uh, very strong woman, right? Very capable woman. She said, I have never felt so overpowered in my entire life. Why? She was fighting a man. Women are, be see, they go, well, Christianity is oppressive to women. No, Christianity helps women. Women are being oppressed by this. Uh, how about this one here? Uh, notice who got the gold medal is in the middle. A guy got it, right? Uh, I mean, that's where this is going. Um, so instead of women getting happier, here's what's really going on. Betsy Stevenson, uh, there, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania uh, did a study on woman happiness, and they call it the paradox of declining female happiness. And it says, uh, they said, by many objective mat measures, the lives of women in the United States have improved over the past 35 years. Yet we show that the measure of subjective well being indicate that women's happiness has declined both absolutely and relative to men. The paradox of women's declining relative well-being is found across various data sets, measures of subjective well-being, and is pervasive across demographic groups and industrialized countries. A relative, de relative declines in female happiness have eroded a gender gap in happiness in which women in the 1970s typically reported higher subjective well-being than did men. These declines have continued and a new gender gap is emerging, one with higher subjective well-being for men. Men are getting happier, women are getting unhappier, and they want to say that Christians are the, are, are the oppressors of women. Christians are the saviors of women. And you see these skinny models. These are real runway models, by the way. That's a real runway model. Um, uh, all I can say is, oh my, what a mess, right? Um, that's gal, that's a mess there. I'm pretty girl, but she's really, I mean, obviously that's not good. See, what's happening is, is women have sex like a man. Uh, then they end up sporting bumper stickers and stuff that say things like this. The better I get to know more men, the more I find myself loving dogs. I think this is funny. Cosmopolitan, as if they put it all together in a big book, 812,683 ways to please your man as opposed to being free, this is how to please your man. Okay, I'm gonna sum this up for, first of all, widows are cared for in Christianity, that's commanded. Secondly, men may not audition women to see if they're good in bed. I actually got into an argument with a non-Christian guy. He says, yeah, no, you gotta sleep with guys. In fact, I've got a friend, he says, uh, uh, this friend of mine, he says, this guy was saying, yeah, no, a woman's gotta, got to sleep with a, you know, guys got to sleep with a woman until they find out how they are in bed because you can't marry them until you find out how they are in bed. And so my friend who has a tendency to ask whatever comes to his mind and is very bold in this kind of thing. And I, I really like it actually. He says, he says, well, what do you think about how does, how does it make you feel the men that slept with your wife before uh, you married her? And he says, I hate it. And so, well, there you go then, huh? Uh, why you should be thinking that's wonderful but and then think about it they auditioned his wife and must have decided that she wasn't good enough in bed but he got her what a mess this is just a mess men aren't must not divorce their wives men must love their wives as christ loved the church and so on and so i'm going to stop there uh, i've talked a lot um i'm now going to open it up there's a lot more i could say on this subject but i'm going to stop there because i've talked for a long time uh, so now I open it up to your questions, comments, or complaints. Uh, question. 
uh, what's the deal with um, gay marriage uh, and if Christians are? You know what? I'm I'm coming in, in, in government. Yeah, I'm co I'm coming back. Uh, Jane is having me back. I think in two weeks. Jane, is that right? It's like March. Something like that. Yeah. March what? First or something like that. March first in two or three weeks, I'm going to come back and talk about gay, the whole gay issue. Uh, and so um, let, let's save the gay issue for that because I definitely intend to talk about the gay issue. And now uh, that's a that's a cliffhanger. There you go. There's a tease. No, well, there you go. That's how you do it. You got to keep people, keep people reeling them in, reeling them in, and buy my books. But there you go. I kid. Uh, go ahead. A any other questions? But you have to unmute your mic. <clears throat> Hey, Clay, I had a question. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for talking with us today. It's um, really, really deep stuff, really good conversation. Um, thank you, Shannon. This is, sorry, it's not quite related to slavery or the oppression of women, but it's um, a question that our chapter has been kind of mulling around for a while, and I was wondering about your take on it. Um, what's your idea about annihilism versus an eternal conscious punishment in hell? My next blog is, an, and this will tell you, the title of my blog, my next blog, in fact, I've written almost the entire thing, is entitled, And the Atheist Shall Lie Down with the Annihilationist. Uh, okay. I, uh, I got news. Annihilation, I spoke at a conference, in fact, in November first or second, I think, called the Rethinking Hell Conference. I think that annihilationism is dangerous uh, to the cause of Christ. Um, atheists, lo look, think about it just for a minute. Uh, all naturalists, atheists and naturalists are almost identical, not exactly, but almost identical. Naturalists, uh, who, who all naturalists believe, right, there's nothing beyond nature, so there's no God beyond nature, so effectively they're atheists. But Atheists are expecting to be annihilated. Think about it for a minute. What, what are they expecting? What did, what did Charles Darwin or Karl Marx think was going to happen to their consciousness once they died? They thought it was going to cease, right? Isn't that what every naturalist is expecting? Is that they'll just suffer a cessation of their consciousness? In other words, and what's the difference between that, the cessation of my consciousness and my being annihilated? Not much. Uh, if anything, my consciousness ceases. And so I think, and I'm not going to get into the arguments in this blog, uh, the scriptural arguments against annihilation, annihilationism. That's a separate argument, but I'm going to do it's a corollary argument and saying that if you guys that are preaching annihilationism are giving atheists exactly what they're hoping for, they're hoping that there won't be any kind of eternal punishment. That's exactly what they want to have happen. And so thus my title, The Atheist Shall Lie Down with the Annihilationist. Uh, that's what they want to hear. And by the way, uh, in Buddhism, you know, nirvana means blowing out. Now, it is true that in a lot of Hinduism and Buddhism, once you hit reach nirvana, you may go on in some sort of, not individualized, but consciousness have some sort of collective consciousness but in the oldest school of buddhism theravada buddhism they call it nirvana without remainder and there's no you just simply cease to exist so not only do you have all the naturalists hoping that they're going to be annihilated that's exactly what they're hoping for but you have theravada buddhists going that's the goal is to cease to exist and so we're going to use annihilationism as a punishment for these people it's not going to stop anybody. It's what they're already want to have happen. So uh, I'd better move on a little bit because it's a little off topic. But but thank you for that question. But watch for my blog. Subscribe to my blog if you want. Uh, and find me on Facebook and whatnot. Uh, find me. Go to my author page. So I'm meet at the five thousand friend level at Facebook. But anyway, uh, good. It's a good question, Shannon. But it's a little. You know, uh, look at my blog and tell me what you think. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you for your sure. thoughts on that. Anyone else? I have a question. Yes. Um, so you mentioned uh, the New World slave trade and mm -hmm. how uh, they use kidnapping as a means to get yeah. their slaves. Sure, um, sure. I think I think 
in America, we're so used to hearing about the European slave trade and how right, that was right. um, yeah, yeah. the main, main mm -hmm. like um, evil doer. And we don't hear much about the Muslim slave trade. We're, oh, and that I've was fast. Heard, I've yes. heard, wait, sorry. Go. I'm sorry, go ahead. I've heard that they've enslaved more Africans than the Europeans. Do you have anything to say about that? I don't know the statistics on that, but it certainly wouldn't surprise me. Uh, you know, I mean, absolutely wouldn't surprise me, so sure. I mean, but yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised at that. An awful lot of slave trading, and this, I think a lot of people would be surprised by this, but if you don't, just Google it. An awful lot of slave trading did not involve white people. Uh, a lot of it did, duh. I'm not denying the obvious. I'm just saying, but, but what you're bringing up is a very important important point that's not discussed enough and that is a lot of slavery uh did didn't involve uh or involved other races and other belief systems absolutely this is the truth i mean obviously new world slavery was a great evil i mean you're kidnapping people but the idea but the bible condemns it unequivocally that's not in question he who steals a man or find, found in his possession shall be put to death. I don't know how it gets clearer than that. Uh, this is wrong. And anyway, this is that's all there is to it. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, I, so let's, oh, oh yeah, 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 you can go first. Women oh. first. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so I have a question um, because you were talking about New World slavery, kind of like it's a past. You're using the past tense. Um, and you did say something about like Christians being one of the first people to like help refute slavery and fight against it. Yes. So I'm wondering what you think about um, like modern day slavery in the form of like human trafficking or like in the labor um, and like some of the sweatshops that are happening overseas. Do you think we as Christians have a responsibility to fight against those types of modern day slavery? Well, I think we do. I think, you know, I mean, obviously there's so many different kinds of evil, as you know, Samantha, you kind of just, uh, you know, you, we can't, all of us can't choose the same one because there's so many different kinds of evil to fight against, but human trafficking is certainly one of them. Uh, and I've known a couple of Christians who have made it their whole ministries to fight against human trafficking. And I obviously, support that 100%. Uh, praise God that they're doing that because yeah, that kind of slavery is still going on and it's rampant uh, and shocking. In fact, I've got, I hope, I don't think anybody's from Baylor here, but Baylor University tells her students not to walk off, just walk off around the campus and start wandering around because they're right near an interstate and they're afraid that their students can be, could be abducted into, into human trafficking. So yeah, that's a, that's a huge issue. You know, the slavery that obviously that I was focusing on was where they go, well, Christians were, you know, I mean, Christians were uh, a large part of what this whole slavery thing in America was. Well, people who called themselves Christians surely were gigantically. But then again, that's why I spent so much time in so many things. And I can apply this to other things, uh, to many other things. Um, but a lot, most people who call themselves Christians are not Christians. And a lot of these are the devil's plants that he's planted them in there. And they're just, they're just simply not Christians. They call themselves Christians. And if you were the devil, wouldn't, isn't that exactly what you want? You know, you want a lot of people to self-identify as being Christians and then have them do all kinds of really, really terrible things. They, and so everybody can go look and go, see how bad these Christians are. See what lying hypocrites they are. But I just, like I say, a new world sl slavery to me is unequivocally refuted by scripture because for the last time, and listen, well, if I need to say it again, I will. It was based on human, it was based on kidnapping. It was based on stealing people. The scripture unequivocally condemns that. So no, no you could not, a, a sincere Christian could not make the case on, you know, from scripture for that. That's just simply wrong. Okay, thank you. Sure. What about, what about buying products um, from... Oh, boy, I'll tell you, just keep a clear conscience. That's way too difficult. The buying, yeah. you know, I mean, buying, I, I get your thing. I understand it. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, and I'm torn. It's so complex because they go, yeah, but these people are only being paid 47 cents a day. And I go, well, how much are they going to get if they're not, if their products aren't being bought? And I don't know the answer to that. You see what I'm saying? 
But if, but I, and I don't know what difference it's going to make if you, one person goes, well, you know, I hear this is where it's coming from. And so I don't have an answer other than to say, as you get informed about these things, keep a clear conscience. That's the best I can do. So that, that book, this kind of out of curiosity, the, the, the 812,000 ways to please your man, was that a satire? Or That's was a that... satire. Okay, that was that was, that was, a satire. That was okay. produced that was produced by the onion okay. if you're familiar oh, with the yeah, onion yeah that was, okay. that was produced that was produced by the onion <laughs> okay. uh, but notice the fact the satire that that the onion which is in the christian satire side that the onion would think this is really funny and this is what's really going on so let's lampoon it so yeah <clears throat> hello so uh, are we talking about politics or is this off topic? Or is this, uh, well, it depends on what the, I don't know what the question is, so I can't tell okay, you. Okay. So, yeah. So, so uh, I'm, I'm a little, little worried about right wing uh, Christianity because, again, I, I understand that Ronald Wiggins and uh, George Bush's and, and the Trumpers, but, uh, you know, the people at Tower Capital who call themselves Christians, are they Christians or are they just, or else the left mean, or the left California media, or the devil. Let me just say again that most Christians aren't Christians. Uh, now you're going to ask, is it, if you're going to ask me, was there one person who stormed the Capitol who might be a sincere Christian? Sure, I don't know. I can't read, you know, I mean, uh, I think that people have gotten caught up in a fervor that's, that's frankly dangerous. I think they need to be more uh, sell, you know, more circumspect about their lives. But, but I don't know, you know, I mean, most people, again, Jesus said the, the gate is narrow, and the road is hard that leads to life and few there are that are on it. Yet 71% as of 2015, 71% of Americans self identified as being Christians. Well, I guarantee you that 71% of Americans are not Christians. Uh, it, I'm not even close. And so, I mean, they're Chinos, Christians in name only, but they're not really Christians. But so, no, I would have no idea of those who stormed the Capitol, how many of them were true Christians. I would imagine most of them weren't, but I surely can't say that all, none of them were. How would I know? Sometimes, look, don't misunderstand me. Sometimes sincere Christians do terrible things. I'm not saying that. Sometimes sincere Christians do terrible things. I'm not that would, I mean, and commit terrible sins. Sometimes sincere Christians commit adultery. They do. Oh, what a mess. But sometimes they do. Sometimes sincere Christians just do terrible things. But anyway, another question. Yes, real okay. quick. Um, okay. Um, on the topic of abortion, um, you know, being Christian and, and having Christian friends that actually um, consider themselves pro-choice, <laughs> a Christian, um, Kind of what is your response to that? And I, and I would say just from my personal experience from the people that I've talked to, their kind of uh, belief is that a uh, woman should just have the choice um, because it's their body. And yeah. also just, uh, I mean, I, I, you clearly, you know, made a good uh, connection of oppression um, of what it's like in our modern day and age and how we sometimes overlook it. But yeah, just kind of. Yeah, wanna... sure. I can do this. Uh, look. I don't even, when I'm talking to non-Christians or anybody, even other Christians, I don't even use the term abortion anymore. I say the suctioning, scraping, and scalding to death of the unborn, uh, because that's what we're talking about. The question, Matthias, and this, this, every argument, every abortion argument falls apart immediately uh, if you understand that all of it's based on the fact that they don't want to grant that what is in the womb is a human person. If what is in the womb is a human person, then, then every abortion argument immediately collapses because you're saying, so uh, if I, a human person, uh, don't want to have, don't want to allow another human person to live, I have the right to kill that human person. Every single argument falls apart. You know, I mean, they all do. The question is, what is in the womb? If, if it's a human person, then all of the all abortion arguments fail. All of them do. There's not one that succeeds if they grant it's a human person. That's the, if it's not a human person, then who cares if they abort it? Big deal. 
But yeah, I think that a lot of people who call themselves Christians, if they understand that they're suctioning, scraping, and scalding to death human persons, if they understand that, and go, well, yeah, but I don't want to, you know, I mean, be a one issue voter. I sit there and think, you know, I think of Germany, uh, of Germany uh, during, let's say, 1926, uh, I can see two Germans standing on the sidewalk and one German says to another, you know, I'm for Adolf Hitler. And if the, the other German saying, you know what, but he wants to kill all the Jews in the world. And the first German says, but I can't be a one issue voter. I think that you, if, it's hard for me to comprehend that if a person truly understands that you are dismembering, suctioning, scraping, or scalding to death unborn human persons, that you can go, yeah, and I'm a Christian. I have trouble with that. So that's my short answer. Am I going to say for sure that they're not? No, because you can be a stupid person. Uh, but yeah, I, I obviously have a very negative attitude towards believing you can suction, scrape, and scald to death human persons and go, yeah, but I'm a good Christian. Um, I have big trouble with that. Anyone else? I have a question. Yes, Carl. Um, so if so many uh, self-proclaimed Christians aren't really Christians, are you willing to share um, like some church recommendations that... Huh that you would refer people to that you think are doing a good job? Where do you live? Oh, I live in Ohio. Oh, and guy. I, well, well, but I, I would I go to Southern the California. first, no, I'm just kidding. I know, uh, I live in Southern California um, and I went to a big church in um, Costa Mesa, but I was just interested in your opinion. I used to attend a big church in Costa Mesa, but anyway, uh, you know, I mean, uh, really it's about finding the pastor Mm -hmm. that you are really convinced is a Christian, because obviously in his church, you're going to have Christians and you're going to have Christians in name only. And so it's about finding a pastor where you go, I think this man really does know the Lord. And I think that for me, I would look for somebody, one, he has doctrinal integrity. I, I, I know where he stands and I agree with him. But, but when it comes to, is he a disciple? Do I see him in his conversations, applying the word of God to his life and trying to obey it? Uh, oh, I, I do. I do. I'm just, I'm just yeah. curious because I really, I, I, it's so interesting the things you're saying. And I just wanted to, I was just curious as to what you would refer people to. Well, I, I would tell them, you know, I mean, I, you know, I mean, in my area, I think I go to a church where the pastor really knows the Lord and is trying to please him. He talks, in fact, this just Sunday, this last, just yesterday morning, as a matter of fact, he says, you know, he says, you've got to read the word and you've got to obey it. And I'm just sitting there going, wow, that's just so right on. You know, I mean, that's just so, but you know, are there other churches that, around here that I go, yeah, yeah, sure. There's a lot. So no, I'm afraid I don't have an easy answer to that. Okay. Anybody else? We've got a whopping like oh, 10 minutes left. So um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking about what you were saying about um, like the conversation on women being oppressed and it kind of reminded me of divorce. And I just wanted to know, understand like what your like view was on um, divorce um, because I've heard a lot of debate about like um, there are like uh, grounds, certain grounds for divorce, mm -hmm. um, but the Bible doesn't mention anything about abuse or anything like that. And that if a person, if a woman is abused or someone is abused within the marriage, they should still stay because there's no grounds for divorce. Right. In the uh, that's a great question, uh, Joya, and, and it's one that I've given a lot, a lot of thought to and is one, a very serious, serious issue that you're talking about. Uh, I do see two, two obvious exceptions for divorce. Uh, Jesus said, who divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. In other words, if your spouse is being unchaste, abandonment i think first corinthians chapter seven says you know the unbelieving partner desires to separate let it be so but then also in 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 uh first corinthians seven it says you know i want you to you should stay married but if you separate then just remain unmarried i think that uh i i, I do think though with if you talk to the elders and the christian research journal did an article on this that i agreed with uh if for instance if your if a woman's husband is really actually trying to physically damage her, I think she needs to, at the very least, get out of there. She needs to get, I'm out, I'm done, We're, I'm gonna get away. Uh, 
whether she should divorce and remarry, I would leave that up to her and the elders of her church. Uh, you know, the outside thing. One of the things is that women who marry abusive men tend to marry abusive men again. Uh, it's there's something they that they're initially attracted to and they don't realize the person's abusive until later. But so that's my best answer is I certainly don't think they should stay in the same house with somebody who's physically abusive to them. I'll, I, no, I don't. I think if, if they're really, if they think they're actually in physical danger, I think they should get out uh, and uh, just, you know, talk to the elders of the church and look for wisdom and guidance. Thank you. Sure. I'm not saying, by the way, they should necessarily remarry. But again, I would defer to the elders of the church and to, to people that really know the situation because marriage is a sacred bond uh, that we need to take very, very seriously. And a lot of people, I think, get out. Well, I know. I know for a fact a lot of people get out way too early. I think there's, you know, anyway, so yeah. Um, opinions uh, about separation between church and state? Uh I don't, well, I, uh, I'll just tell you for me as a Christian who is a citizen of the United States, I certainly do not think for a moment that, that the United States should in any way, shape, or form institute Christianity as the, as the country's religion. I think that would be stupid uh, and, and simply not biblical. But as a voter, I can vote my conscience as other voters can, but I I would not, you know, for instance, if they said we're going to turn and make America a nation, a Christian nation, well, how, that's, first of all, that's not possible. Why? Because most of the people in America aren't Christians. I understand that most of the people in America, <coughs> excuse me, might self-identify as Christians, but we have, I happen to know better. I know they're not Christians because, um, well, of the things that I've said, see, uh, the, the reformers discern between the church visible and the church invisible. The church invisible are those people who call themselves Christians who really are Christians. The church visible uh, is just everybody that says they're a Christian. We cannot distinguish, we humans cannot distinguish between the church visible and the church invisible. Uh, we're just, we just don't have the ability. Th that will occur at the judgment, but we, we can't do that now. But I would certainly reject any idea that we're going to make America a Christian country. I think that would be it just it's impossible. Most Americans aren't Christians. How are you going to do that? And I think that the lack of discernment on some people that think that's a good idea. Honestly, I think a lot of the people who think that are Christians in name only, and a lot of them are devils are the devil's seed trying to just simply get people off the topic. And I know a lot of you are thinking, "Come on, Clay, you don't have to pull punches with us. Tell us what you really think." But that's what I really think. Anyone else? Well, I know it's already come up a couple of times or a few times. I'm still kind of stuck on the, uh, the criteria of true Christianity. And I was thinking about the no true, no true Scotsman fallacy. Yeah, that's, you know, atheists have brought that up. But remember something, uh, the Bible defines what a Christian is. For those of you that don't know, the no, no true Scotsman, true scotsman is kind of a joke real uh, i mean it's a real thing but it's kind of you know say well no true scotsman would ever you know do whatever he says well he was born in scotland and his parents were born yeah but no true scotsman yeah but see there the denotation of a scotsman is someone who's born in scotland but the denotation of a christian is someone who has been born from above and who has decided to make Jesus the Lord of their life and has decided, now watch this, to stop sinning. There's only two possibilities. You can decide to stop sinning or you can decide to not stop sinning. Those are the only two possibilities. And a Christian is someone who's decided to stop sinning. Now those words, actually I got those words from Dallas Willard, but, <clears throat> but really it's a Christian is someone who's made Jesus the Lord of their life which is another way of saying a Christian is someone who's decided to stop sinning. Jesus is my Lord, and I'm going to do what he says. Anyone who says, I'm a Christian, but, but has not decided that Jesus is the Lord of his life is a liar. 
and and so when it this so the in that so the no true, true Scotsman fallacy doesn't come in because that's you know I mean the Scotsman is someone who was born in Scotland and whose family is from Scotland for crying out loud and saying but we don't like the way he behaves but Christianity defines tells us what it is uh, and so you know I mean a Christian is is someone again who is born again who is filled with the Holy Spirit. And we know certain things about them. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross daily and follow me. Um, uh, he who saves his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So people that just go, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, but they aren't interested in actually doing what Jesus said. They're not Christians. Now, let me take this a step further. The Great Commission is go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. The great omission, Dallas Wood came up with this too, the great omission is teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. Anybody that's not teaching people to obey what Jesus said is not a Christian teacher. And anyone who's not trying to obey what Jesus said is just simply not a Christian. But see, that's the Bible defines Christianity. The world doesn't define Christianity. Out. And, and the true Christian, again, is someone who's been born again. They've become obedient from the heart, and they actually want to do God's will. I'll give you another passage. John in 1 John, the entire book of 1 John is about knowing whether you're saved or not. And John says in 1 John that no one who is born of God continues to sin because God's nature abides in him, and he cannot go on sinning because he's been born of God. Now, what John's not saying there, what he's not saying is, is that Christians don't sin, or I'm not a Christian, because I sin lots. But no one who is a true Christian, no one who's born of God, says John, continues in sin. In other words, just lets sin run in his life and doesn't try to stop it. That person, says John, is not, uh, is not born of God. Uh, and so the Bible is the one that tells us what is the criteria for being a true Christian. A true Christian, there's lots of criteria in First John on whether you really are a Christian. Uh, another one is, is that you confess your sins. Uh, you know, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, he'll forgive our sin. Another one is, is that you truly love your neighbor. Uh, now, again, for the last time, I'm not saying that true Christians don't commit terrible sins. Uh, they don't get selfish and they, you know, blah, blah, blah. Of course they do. But I am saying that a true, Christ, a true Christian, and there's many verses like this, especially in 1 John, I'll say it again, no one who is born of God continues to sin because God's nature abides in him, and he cannot go on sinning because he's been born of God. So the only people that really are true Christians are those who are trying to do God's will. So <clears throat> touching on that no true Scotsman deal, <clears throat> This past election was um, um, an example of that when, you know, Christians were voting and it was like, well, no, no true Christian can vote for the Democratic Party. Well, yeah. What are your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are uh, that issue is really super complex. Uh, but to me, for me personally, uh, and I, I think you can be a true Christian, and uh, I think you're mistaken, because for me, it was about abortion. Uh, to be honest, to me, it was about abortion. <clears throat> What's the uh, difference I, there? I, just a second. I thought Trump, frankly, he, he was an embarrassment, largely. But uh, if, well, it's Frank Beckwith, who is a apologist, a scholar at Baylor, he says, you know, he says, let's reverse everything. Let's suppose that instead of about abortion, it was about ending slavery in America. Everything else is the same. Trump is for ending slavery in America and Biden is not. Now, who would you vote for? The, see, for me, the, I think Frank Beckwith's argument was a good one. And the reason I think it was is because to me, uh, I can't imagine sitting there and going, w w we're not gonna end slavery? I mean, really? I can, I can and, but see, the, one more thing. The mm -hmm. people on the other hand who say, Oh yeah, but it's abortion's not as bad as slavery. I'm like suctioning, scraping, and scalding to death 815,000 unborn babies every single year is really bad. So go ahead, last comment. I, I completely agree with you. However, um, the pushback I got was, because I use that line, by the way, the pushback I got was, well, when Trump had the White House and the House and the Senate, 
they did nothing to stop it. He even signed the bill well, to fund Planned Parenthood. Uh, yeah, uh, about that, there's a lot of people. One of our graduates is a guy named Scott Klusendorf. And I know Scott. Was, I would, I would talk to Scott. Scott's got phenomenal answers to that. Uh, I, you know, see, there's another thing. You know how we're talking about human trafficking? Huge issue. Needs to stop. Yeah. People need to work. Uh, abortion, huge issue. Needs to stop. Uh, but, you know, Scott, that's his, you know, that's where he's put his focus. Mine is on, you know, different. And I, but I would defer to Scott and that. And, and it's nine o'clock, by the way. And I know that nine o'clock is officially like our stopping time. And so, uh, are you still there, uh, Jane? I don't yes. Know. Thanks, Doc. There you are. No, there you are. Your your picture moved or something. Well, it's nine o'clock. So is there? You know, I guess we'll call it a day. Or yeah, we could end here, and he'll be back on March first, talking about the what is the title of it again? <laughs> it's about uh, he. Well, I've changed the title slightly to uh, curing sexual insanity. Okay. We'll talk about homosexuality, transgenderism, uh, and and uh, you know, I mean, for that matter, pornography, and and because Christians, honestly, we need to have intelligent things to say about this because our world is a mess, and so we will hopefully uh, make be hopefully I'll be able to make uh, some intelligent comments about this because we really need to understand this our, our world is just such a mess as I don't need to tell you I mean people and I think it's dangerous that Christians are embarrassed I, I understand why Christians are a little embarrassed to talk about the topic I get it uh, but uh, we need to talk about the topic because um, the world is wallowing in it and we need to be the answer and the help to them and not just sit there and go, well, this is too embarrassing, so I don't want to talk about it. So that's what we're talking about on March 1st. Well, anyway, it's been a pleasure to be with all of you. And I'm going to now sign off and let Jane do whatever it is that Jane does. And a pleasure. And I'll talk to you on March 1st. Great. Thanks, Clay. Okay. Thank my you, Clay. pleasure. Okay. Bye. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, have a good night. We'll see you. Oh, wait. We're not off all. President's Day. So we'll see you in two weeks. That was awesome. Thanks, Jane. Are you going to send that out? Yeah. Could you please send me that recording? Yeah, so I'm going to upload it. You guys, you guys still have the link where I usually post everything up, right? You still have No. The link? Okay. Um, let me see if I could get that for you guys right now. Yeah, I can't wait for March 1st. <laughs> me too. A lot of opinions, yeah, a lot of opinions about that. Yeah. Bring some uh, friends, Norris. Bring some yeah. friends. Yeah. I, I want to clarify something. Uh, so what's this? What's this? Uh, now I'm, I'll, I'll research it. But you guys are chill that I'm the only atheist still. I'm okay with it. It's just I, I like this club. Yeah, I just chill <laughs> with it because I, I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to say some dumb things and. Hey man, this is a safe space for you. You could ask whatever you want. And yeah. we have a cousin, Joey. He's agnostic, so. <laughs> yeah, he answers all my questions. I'm a little conflicted with the abortion and the feminism, but eh, it's my opinion. But uh, yeah. Uh, Something to chew on, think about it, uh, see if it's persuasive enough for you to change your mind. At the end of the day, it's your choice to believe what you think is true. Um, but I hope we gave you enough information for you to consider. Yeah, I, I mean, me and Chris talk about, and and, and Danielle talk about uh, abortion a lot, and I'm still I'm still thinking about it to this day. Mm -hmm. I'm still I'm still conflicted, but uh, Chris yeah, helped me a lot with uh, my opinion. But yeah, uh... yeah, like like what he said is, if it's a human being, then we have a problem. If it's not a human being, then go ahead and do the abortion but i think the problem is people don't want to define it as a human being yeah so. yeah it's just it's an unpro choice because okay i believe it's murder but i mean i think it's justified because again, again one's body it's one's body uh i don't want, i don't like the government telling me what to do and uh well most because i'm a man but I'm just, again, okay, I'm still conflicted. Yeah. Uh, I see pro choice because, you know, motive's motive, but uh, again, very, uh, usually, I, usually I tell myself, uh, I'm just a man. Uh, I, I let uh, women do deal with it, but 
I don't know. Am I you're just a man. I mean, I, I think when people say men don't have a say in it, I think that's what you call a genetic fallacy, correct, Chris? Yeah, so, I mean, it does take a man and a woman to create a baby, so I think men should be part of the conversation. I, I've worked for um, crisis clinics where there's a lot of men who suffer from um, depression because they have had their child aborted without their decision in it. So I think it affects a man just as much as it affects a woman. Um, so I think men should be part of the conversation too when it comes to abortion. Yeah, yeah. but I think, I think using the government power, I mean, it's, oh yeah, it's, oh yeah I, don't like the, I don't like the government forcing people to not get aborted, but unless, unless there's a safe way, but Again, me, me, Chris, they bad about uh, this about a lot. Uh, I I agree with what Jane said about the genetic fallacy. Uh, I mean, an idea is either a good idea or not based on itself. It doesn't matter whose mouth it comes out of. But I would also comment that the current culture, the current climate, is uh, acknowledging things like intersectionality and. Uh, personal experience as part of the weight of what you say. So if you want to talk about, say, racism and you're white, then you don't have the same inside information, so to speak. So if you're not a woman, you don't have the same inside information. And if you try to use logic, then you are part of the hegemony and you're part of the problem. <laughs> you're using white imperial logic so there's there's a lot going on there there's the the argument and principle and then there's all that cultural stuff going on so it gets kind of kind of muddy so we gotta parse that all out anyways yeah. we, 